Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 41 of the Fitness Business Growth Podcast. Today, I'm here with Ben Fletcher, the proud founder, owner, and franchisor of Listen to Your Body Australia. Ben, how are you, mate? Good, thanks. Yourself? Really, really good, mate. Thanks for coming on. I want to go on the Ben Fletcher story from zero locations to 14 and growing every single month. Cue the intro, and we'll be back in a second. Welcome to the Fitness Business Growth Podcast, a podcast run by gym owners for gym owners. My name is Mitch, and along with Jamie, we are your hosts, and we will be discussing all the important things that you need to run a successful fitness business. From marketing, to lead generation, to sales, to retention, to staff, and much, much more. So if you are a fitness business owner, then this is for you. We hope you enjoy the following episode and we will speak with you soon. And mate, we're back. How are you? Good, thanks. Yourself? Mate, that, there are our two gyms breakthrough active, so you got to see inside them. Nice. Yeah, look sharp. Well, well, mate, me and Ben were introduced. Uh, I'm currently working with two of his franchisees, Oscar um, and Amanda. And I am just so impressed with the Listen to Your Body franchise, mate, and what you guys stand for. So before we talk about where you are today, mate, I start the podcast with this exact question for everyone. If I met you at a party, Ben, what do you do? What do I do? As the funny thing is, when people say, what do you do with yourself? I usually just say, I'm just in the fitness industry and, <laughs> and play it down a little bit. I say, yes, in the fitness industry, do a bit of management stuff. That's always my throwaway line because when you go, oh, yeah, I'm a, um, I'm a franchisor and this is this, and then sometimes it gets a bit complicated. So I, I sort of prefer in a party to more ask questions about other people rather than, you know, say what I sort of do and, you know, say, oh, right, I'm the franchisor, the CEO, the manager director yeah. of the company, or this, 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 this. I just say, yeah, I'm just in the fitness industry and management. How about yourself? So that's the actual Mate, truth. That's so good. I always deflect. What do you do? I'm in fitness. What do you do? Straight away. Yeah. Yeah, 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 like, yeah, oh, yeah. Franchise or a franchisee, which one's which? You just get yeah. in this rabbit hole that you don't want to have to do. Yeah, it's a longer conversation. And those that are in franchising know it inside out, so you can have that conversation. Uh, those that are not, I go, oh, yeah, no worries at all. So I just like to say the fitness industry. So, um, yeah, cool, yeah. man. Cool. Yeah. Well, mate, we met the other day. Uh, we spoke for about half an hour, really tactical about your franchise, but I don't actually know you. And on yeah. these podcasts, I like to go on the journey with the audience and just learn about your story. So, mate, take me back a couple of years, maybe even longer. How did you get started in the fitness industry? So, to, <laughs> a couple of years, uh, a few, a few more years of that now, Jamie. Probably similar to yourself, but it was, it was two thousand and one, actually, twenty two years ago. Uh, I had I had a bit of hair back then, but uh, just just was, so you know, mate, I was in I was in year six in two thousand and one. So, oh, not, not wow, as as okay, sorry, mate, sorry, mate. Yeah, <laughs> so um, I um, yeah, I was. I was actually a landscape gardener by trade in the late 90s and um, I was trying to be a professional sports person, a professional cricketer, and um, I was in a um, professional environment for a 12-month period, which was a great experience, but I didn't quite make it. I wasn't good enough, truth be known. But then on the side, while I was doing that, I was um, starting to be a personal trainer and I okay. um, always, always loved fitness and also having that experience with, you know, like six full-time, um, you know, strength and conditioning coaches. I just, you know, was loving it, absolutely you know, hanging on to every word they were saying about how to prepare the body, etc. So that's how I sort of like, I guess, um, I was already becoming a trainer, but that's how I got more motivation to be a trainer was sort of learning more. And I was always into fitness and one thing led to another. And I yeah, started as a PT at the end of that period, which was actually, um, yeah, late 2001, 2002. Yeah, far out, man. So 2001, you were in the early days, early, early days. I, yeah. it's, it's, just, it's almost interesting to think about me, but even anytime fitness was like started in Australia in 2007. So pre any time there was like these just, there was one gym in every town. Yeah. So like yeah. what was that experience? Like, were you a PT? Were you a group instructor? Did you manage a gym? Like what, what, where was your first job, job in fitness? Yeah, I was actually pretty lucky, I reckon. I was at Ascot Bar Leisure Centre, which is, um, at the time, I believe it was the biggest gym in the Southern Hemisphere. I could be wrong, but that was what, what the common like the common communication was. It was like 6,000 members, and um, I started out there as a fitness instructor, 
And then um, one thing led to another. Then I was a personal trainer one-on-one, but I reckon I was really lucky. I got in at this time where like it hit America really hard in the late nineties. Everyone's getting a trainer and it was like a real cool thing to do. So when I started, I was at that, I was at the bottom, you know, like, and we sort of come up this massive peak of one-on-one towards the late two thousands, but I was sort of in there early and, it was crazy. Like some days, like start at 5 a.m., finish at like 9 p.m., have an hour off to train and just hope that people would run late by one minute to get a banana in. <laughs> or even yeah, back then, I was right. was a just to get the fuel in. So it was pretty yeah. cool. But um, yeah, that's how I cut my teeth in the industry yeah. as a one-on-one PT. Yeah. In my 34 years of wisdom, Ben, I think human beings are terrible at conceptualizing time. Yeah. And we accept the new normal so quickly. And it yeah. is unimaginable to live in a world without boutique group fitness, which is probably what the majority of the market is. But it was like, you join a gym, it's not 24 seven. You say hi mm. to the receptionist and then you meet mm. your trainer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly right. That's exactly what happens. So, and then in back then as well in the industry is like, there was four gym instructors on the floor at a big box gym. And then you'd have your own area. And if someone did a seated, <laughs> seated row wrong, you'd be saying, oh, excuse me, Jamie, just pull your shoulders back a little bit, brace your core. And they'd look at it you're like, you're, <laughs> you're trying to sell them a ghost or something. Yeah. But but uh, that was what the industry was like then. Yeah. And obviously, and t- a lot. 2001, mate, what were you charging per hour? I'm curious. Yeah, good question. Um, forty-five bucks an hour. Yeah, there, there's inflation. It's a hundred now. Yeah, yeah, it's forty-five bucks. And back then, uh, I felt like we're at the top of the tree. Income wise, a twenty-two, twenty-three-year-old, like doing eighty sessions a week, not eighty hours, because some of them were forty-five yeah. minutes, half hour, but eighty to ninety some weeks, and it was it was really good money back then. I guess cost of living, obviously, back then was a lot different. So uh, I guess yeah. it's all relevant. Mm. It's interesting, mate. I, I I know quite a few PTs, and a successful PT in a big box club can still make a good income. They like, they really can. Like twenty five sessions a week, half hour, hundred dollars. Like there is there is still money in personal training, and I think it's I think it's quite often demonized. Is like don't trade your money for time. Mm. But at the end of the day, mate, if you're cutting your teeth in the industry, I could make an argument that you should be trading your time for money to learn the skills. Mm. Yeah, spot on. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a great way to. There's so many skills actually you pick up you pick up doing it. So like everything down to yeah, communication, structure, time management, um, obviously um, then obviously the skills of the job. So yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. I think the biggest thing that was a massive advantage for me, mate, was I worked at Fitness First. Yeah. Uh, my yeah. first job. And you go into the fitness industry thinking, I love fitness, I wanna help people, and then all of a sudden you realize, hang on, there's a call drive. Mm. <laughs> they, yeah. they have lead, lead, lead to appointment ratio appointment to a consultation and yeah. salary ratio i think it's just a really good introduction hey like we love fitness but it's still a business mm. and that marketing and sales are just so important yeah i agree i agree with that i think it's um it's a huge it's a huge part yeah it's when we got into it, it wasn't really spoken about too much, but it's like I was probably one of those fortunate ones earlier that I actually had an obsession with business as well as PT. So like as soon as I was booked out, I put on one staff member too. Before I knew it, I actually had 17 personal trainers. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, I actually had like at the time, I think we were the second biggest that I knew of, um, at least in Victoria, that did PT. But we're doing like some weeks like pushing 500 um, or and some actually more than that. It's actually 500 sessions a week of pt like yeah so mate that's too good of a story to just brush over so you're a fully booked pt Mm. we're talking like 2001 2002 ish and then you thought okay like i've got more people that want to work for me this has gone from a one-man band a solopreneur into like this is the real business now yeah what was that next step for you in terms of hiring a trainer and what was that journey like yeah, it was pretty crazy because I was not. I had a waiting list of fifteen. I was knocking them back, um, it pretty much daily. So I go, yeah, I got one person, got them full, got two, got three, got four, and obviously there was ups and downs on the way. Not everyone works out as we know, but um, and over an eight year period, it was it was pretty interesting business. Like we had. As I said, at one stage we had, it was close to 20 trainers, like hundreds and hundreds of sessions. It wouldn't be uncommon to see 13 LTYB trainers on this gym floor in a big box club. But the other thing about it, if anyone wanted a trainer out of 6,000, they could only come to listen to your body. The start, the, the, the center did not employ any other trainers and um, the, you, you couldn't be an independent there. We actually had the exclusive rights of personal training out of a 6,000 member gym. So anyone Man. wanted to adopt, 
Yeah, it was a crazy contract. I sort of so, and the reason. So listen, sorry, mate. Listen to your body was a, a personal training company. Yeah. That would contract to gyms, and you had yeah. like exclusivity. Like, hey, yeah. we'll serve these six thousand members. Yeah. W- were you on rent? Were you paying profit share? Like, how did that work? We paid them eighty five grand a year in rent, which was a bit of money back then. Um, so we paid them eighty five grand a year instead of them collecting even call it one fifty to two hundred from from individual trainers, but they couldn't really get off the ground that much. So it was probably good. But not only was the 85 that we got for them, say we had 500 members, we would have in, like tripled their retention on those members because they were getting results. So they kept the membership as well. So we we're probably worth half a million to them a year or whatever the numbers are exactly. Yeah. But so it was a good, it was a good contract um, that, that we had. It was pretty crazy. Yeah. So those words, retention, lifetime value, profit, as a personal trainer, you don't learn them typically in Cert 3 and Cert 4. Like how did you develop your business acumen? Yeah, it's a good question. I always had a passion for business, even before sort of I started a PT. Like I always probably had the entrepreneurial spirit, whether it was passed down through family. But like I won the <laughs> it sounds ironic on a fitness podcast, but I won the chocolate drive every year at school because <laughs> I wanted to win. But anyway, I was uh, selling chocolate to the market at two in the morning because I could get to the fruit market because I knew they couldn't leave their stands when when everyone went there. So I went to their stands and sold them chocolates as a Man, talk, talk about a starving market, hey. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. But um, so I probably already had that. And I guess, um, you know, what I realized early, I'm um, coming from a sports background as well, I needed coaching. So I just, um, I had a good business coach at the time and I always seeking advice. And I sort of trained a lot of very successful business people as well that sort of, I guess, um, looking back on it now, they might have thought, uh, you know, without saying, I don't want to sound like a hero, you probably worked out, I try and play things down a little bit. But they probably saw a bit of entrepreneurial spirit and said, this young guy's having a good crack. I'm happy to invest into him by way of Man. time. And and, yeah. and and I remember sitting with the CEO of, um, he just finished at Racing Victoria, what a huge job. And uh, I w- went out for lunch with him and I went to um, pay for the lunch and I was pretty naive. And he goes, man, I'll get it, I'll get it. And I was 30 bucks back then. And then <laughs> when someone what, someone else said, oh, you went, went lunch with this guy, I go, yeah, yeah, just tell me everything you about business. Awesome, there for 90 minutes. One of the best meetings I've ever had. He goes, you know, his hourly rates are usually like a thousand bucks, right? I go, oh, geez, is it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but so I guess I just sort of learned off a lot of people. And, yeah. Um, yeah. Mm- it's so interesting, mate. My first ever venture into PT, I trained a child psychologist. Yeah. He owned three studio – studio is a bad word. He owned three yeah. clinics. Clinics, um, yeah. And he had 27 psychologists working for him. Wow. And, man, like he taught me so much about business. He's like, yep. So, so he said, Jamie, don't believe what you see. Like it's harder than you think. Like yeah, I've got, yeah. I've, got to, I've got to pay those 27 people for four weeks over Christmas. Like yeah. he was such a nice, humble guy. And he was obviously very successful, but like, I think being an entrepreneur is glorified. Like it's easy. Like mm. look at my staff, look at my locations, look at how much money I make. He's like, yeah. like, don't get me wrong, Jamie, I've done well, but like, it's not, it's not, it's not what you think it is. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And I think that people who have been through it, they know the bumps and bruises along the way that keeps people humble. So um, mm. yeah, I, I, I definitely agree. With that. And it's probably the other side of entrepreneurs that want to, probably driven by so i guess external factors and that's their their sort of um what what they want to do but i think a lot i agree a lot are we pretty humble because i know they've they've copped a bit to um to go through to grow a business well mate what drives you uh impact see impact i like having an impact and i like seeing results from people and i also coach cricket i coach a premier club in victoria here and i sort of get a lot of um i get a lot of joy out of that seeing you know people get better at their skills so it's just like i had a studio um the first founding studio i was a pumping studio that was in 2008 and then I sort of like thought, oh, this is really cool. People are traveling from all over Melbourne to this place. This is a great concept. It's different. No one's doing it. But it was like, it wasn't enough. It was like, yeah, I could have stayed there and I'd probably work five, 10 hours a week and I'd have all the financial freedom I wanted to or the lifestyle and et cetera. But it wasn't enough because I wanted to... I wanted to reach out to more people, you know, like even in Adelaide at a field visit, you know, two months, oh, what was it now, a month or so ago, you know, someone come up and said, oh, are, you, are you Ben? I go, yeah. They go, best concept I've ever done. I'm 60 years old. I've never, never succeeded at gyms. And um, I've been here nine months and it's literally saved my life. You know, it's Man, saved my cool. life. So, so it's just impact for me. It's impact. It's not money. Money comes with it. I love money. Of course, everyone, every entrepreneur does. But for me, it's like having impact, positive impact um, and changing people's life. And yeah, yeah leaving a legacy. I think, people, I think people confuse that, right? Like if you help enough people, you'll have all the money you ever need. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all about trying to give, um, you know, I won't say give to get, but yeah, got to 
give out and um yeah see impact like even our business owners like not even our business owners they're our customers but like our business owners are so critical to us our franchisees our number one goal was franchisee profitability by country mile ahead of growth ahead of you know anything else mate mate, i want to really get into that in a minute but we've jumped 10 steps because you're okay sorry sorry, man (laughs) you're you're a pt you're a pt you yeah. were contracted to a gym. You were paying eighty five thousand yeah. dollars a year rent, and you had you've mentioned about five hundred sessions a week. Is that correct? Yeah, it'd be pretty close to that. Yep, yep, yeah. So then, obviously, like you had a really successful PT company. When did you leave that place and launch your your own studio? Like, what was that transition like? From okay, I, I'm P- PT. I'm going to open yeah. up my own space. And was that space the first listen to your body, or was it named something else? Yeah, so 2008, we got our first site um, in Strathmore, Victoria, and basically what happened, we had two businesses going, um, and then when we opened the studio in Strathmore, as Listen to Your Body, so the name Listen to Your Body got incorporated in 2004, Warrior 101, so Warrior at Ascobar, we're Listen to Your Body, we retain that, and then we did the 2008 model for one year where we crossed over and ran both. But then I was so I needed to break free from Asco Vale because I couldn't confuse the market with running two operating systems because they're totally mm. different. So, yep. um, yeah, at that point, we stopped at Asco Vale. And 2008, yeah, we launched our first one um, into Strathmore and we tried the model before we went to the market. And we did that for a fair few years before we even franchised. So that's interesting, right? Because people have one studio that isn't open five years, hasn't been proven to be successful long term, and they start franchising. What are your thoughts on that? Because I, I have some, I have some very strong thoughts. I've got some strong thoughts as well. Like my honest view is like. Firstly, get proof of concept as a as a founder. That's the first point. You've got to as a founder because if the founder can't do it, no one will. Then get proof of concept as a franchisee, secondly, and then replicate. So you got to say, well, just because, and that's what we did. Like when we opened our first one, franchise, I basically gave away a free franchise. I said, I said, oh, I don't really want my, I don't want a franchise fee, which is unheard of, as you know, but I just want to test to see how franchisable it is. Yeah. So then when you go to market, um, when you go to market, you've got genuine proof of concept. So you've got all the confidence in the world that those people will be successful. Because if you go too early before you prove yourself, you, you, it's a really dangerous game to, for people to invest into. And some people, you know, go in eyes shut um, without understanding that. And it's a risky game. Yeah. So I so, like proof so your, of concept. Your, yeah. your idea behind was proof of concept as you being the owner operator. Yeah. And then almost do a, do a freebie to ensure that, hey, like this is successful yeah. without Ben. Yeah, 100%. 100%. And then even when we did our rollout, it was quite slow. And at even varied times, I was like, oh, franchise profitability is at this level. I need it at that level. So we just take down our ads to grow. Now, we've got to Mm. fix our system before we keep growing because – like hand on heart, you need to sell a franchise that you think the people will be successful. So, um, and that's why I think it's a really good strategy to grow slow, continue to test and go, oh, can this replicate to this many? I genuine feel that, um, yeah, like over the years, we've developed that more and more, but instead of being in a hurry, quickly roll out, sell, sell, sell. Um, proof yeah. of concept is very important. This is my belief, mate, and it will get me in trouble with some franchisors. Like, mm. if you open a studio and it's been 12 months and it's successful, and then you expect people to do a five year franchise agreement when you yeah. can't tell them what your revenue is going to be month, m- yeah. not only month 60, you can't yeah. tell them month 24. I just yeah. think that, like, I think that selling a franchise is really fucking serious. Like, <laughs> that's <laughs> good. It's a five year commitment. It is yeah. it is a it is this person's dream. Yeah. And I just think that you should do every and that's why I really, really have a lot of time for you and respect for you, mate, because you you've done it the right way. Like you you care about your franchisees. And I'm not saying that all the franchises don't, but like yeah. It's, it's their fucking livelihoods. <laughs> mm. oh, I totally agree, mate. It's called cool being a responsible franchisor and the ones that quickly try and roll out and sell and get really nice brochures and et cetera and all on a maybe uh, compared to an actual. Um, and then you also got to, you got to weather each storm as well, like through that studio. Okay, well, 
for example, um, even though it's not directly related to us, but say a Good Life Health Club opened up around the corner. It's like, oh, does that affect our business? Does that wipe her out? But we learned that, as your, to your point, we learned that in year three. Does Good Life open up around the corner or affect us? Well, actually, nothing at all. We're competing for a totally different member. One's an inactive beginner and one of them's like a bit more of a self-starter in, in a way, mm. I guess. So, um but after 12 months, you don't learn what storms you can actually weather as a as a business before you go five years. And then five years, it's not just a franchise agreement. It's clearly the lease agreement, your repayments on equipment, your payroll. You, you've got to say, can I sell $1.4 million of memberships in five years or whatever the numbers mm. are for each business? Yeah, so I agree. Yeah. I, I, I think from both sides, I think the franchisors typically need to be more responsible. Mm. And then I think the franchisees coming in need to ask better questions. Yeah. But I think I think the franchisees, they're typically members of the franchise that get yeah. go to a studio, they have a great experience. I yeah. want to own one. Mm. And that's as far as they think, right? I just think like like take a deep breath. Mm. Like really, really mm. have a think about it and, and, and investigate it. You've got to balance, you've always got to balance emotion and logic. So it's like, well, yeah, oh, I really want this, you know. Oh, yeah, I've got to do this. It's like we've actually said no to franchisees because potential franchisees, because they're it's, We've got a five-step process at level at step one, even after two-hour meeting, because they love the model so much. Where do I sign and go? No, you, you're not going to make this work. Then we've actually knocked them back because they haven't got through the process. If they're thinking, Man, like that, how, how do you say no to a franchise fee? We actually said no to. I said no to someone. I said no to someone when we had three that was willing to buy five up front and give us back then 150k as a startup franchise, which hand, handy money. And I actually said, and the person, you know, with all respect, smoked cigarettes. And this, I, please, I'm not being judged and saying this, smoked cigarettes, 150,000, um, so 150 kilograms, um, good businessman, but just wanted to kick the money and get a management structure in place. But we weren't proven as an owner operator to, to the highest level, let alone the investment model. As a matter of fact, we don't even do investment models now where you just set and forget and, you know, they've still got to be operational within the business. So at the time, 150K, wow, this is pretty cool. <laughs> but I said, yeah. honestly, mate, I'm not going to take the money because I don't think – I don't think it'll work for you and I don't think it'll work for us and it'll end up being pretty ugly. And if we get um, studio four, five, six, seven, eight wrong, the whole thing goes down. So I'd say no. So, but yeah, I'd say, say no, they don't jump through the hoops. That means they're not committed to the process. That means they won't follow systems in the heat of battle. And there's one thing about franchising, the ones that haven't made it, I think in franchising, 99% is because they don't follow the systems. And they're, they're, thank God there's only a few. I don't want to speak out of school too much. But the ones that um, like the ones that smash it are the ones that follow the system. So um, mm. you need to give people every chance to succeed. So with that five-step process, mate, because I've got no idea about franchising. Like, like, mm. like couldn't have, don't have a clue. What yeah. is that five-step process like for someone? If someone wanted to invest in listen to your body, yeah. What is that five-step process? So they'll usually they'll start, say step one's the informal discussion. So they'll inquire through however that is, word of mouth members, seek, Facebook ad, whatever, whatever. In, so it's informal first. And in that talk, there's obviously a bit of a there's a plan to follow to see whether they're aligned to us and say, oh yep, yeah, they want it for this reason. Okay, that's good. Yep, yeah, that area is good. Financially got a bit of strength and they're in it for the right reasons. So that's all good. Then after that, we go into due diligence. So we send them an expression of interest form. We go through what we call a level two information slide deck go through everything uh field questions they usually go in that due diligence they speak to owners they speak to their accountants see if they've got the money so it's due diligence all of a sudden step two we go well you know what we're both on the same page we want to do it because it is a partnership it's not it's not a majority for anyone it's a partnership step three they apply for the franchise so they've still got to apply for it it's about a one hour document the process then we do our different checks questionnaires etc can i back up mate Come back up yeah. when they apply for a franchise. Have they already chosen a territory, or have you found that? Have you got sites available, or what? What's that like? Territory, territory, territory first. The reason why territory first because no one wants to entertain a site first because we haven't gone through the process, and then therefore it gets really sticky when it comes to the lease arrangement. Because if the franchise doesn't go ahead, and then they go into a lease and independent, especially if they're inexperienced, they're going to get fried. Like they know nothing. Like. Um, and I know you're an independent and I'm not saying mate, that. Sorry, yeah, mate. There's, you know there's, too, there's too much good information here. I need to break that down. So <laughs> sorry. Like, they would they would apply for like a territory. So say, hey, I yep. want to open up and listen to your body in Newcastle. Yeah. Yep. 
Yeah. Yep. And then so, once they once they get approved, because you've got more experience dealing with landlords and, mm. and you, you would then negotiate the lease. So step three would be the franchise application for the territory and, you know, the financial um, strength, the, the reasons, how you're going to support yourself, your key values, what areas do you need, feel you need support in. Long questionnaire. Step four, they come down to head office for one day, meet other owners, head office staff, experience the sessions, yada, yada, yada. Step five, we do a franchise agreement. So we've, they've purchased the territory. Step six, we then nominate the start date where we get together. We look for the site. We do 99% of the heavy lifting with that. We've got 44-step criteria on a site. needs to be X, Y, Z. We land a site. Then we help them get the permit. The, we'll get the person to the professional so, to do that. So you mentioned, so you mentioned before, if they chose this site on their own, they don't have that forty-four step process. That they, they don't know what they're looking for. They may overpay the rent. Right. They may not have parking. They may not have council approval. Absolutely. All that sort of stuff. Yeah, they might even have a dem demolition clause in there. They might um, get. There might be six percent increases. Who knows? Yeah. But we yeah, do that I think, yeah, I've got a friend in Newcastle, mate. He purchased a franchise, and he signed a lease inside a shopping center. And the increase was fourteen percent each year, nah, so his rent was going to go up eighty percent. Sorry, seventy percent in five years. Crazy. Yeah, they won't make money. And the problem with that is, in business, Jamie, as you know, you always need a saleable business. So if you want to sell your business after year three or four, no one's going to buy it if you've got to pay the rent. It's one of the biggest driving factors for a saleable business is a good lease agreement. So we'd make sure that's in place at the start. So, mate, how do you how do you define a territory? Is it like like, so for, for example, like, so there was at one point seven F45s in Newcastle. Yeah. Like, for example, one in Newcastle, one in Warners Bay, one in Mayfield. Like, how do you actually sure. determine what's a big enough size and how far apart they have to be, et cetera? Yeah. So we've got a 4K rule, four kilometer rule. So minimum 4Ks is one of our rules. Um, we've also got like population. We always aim for 30% or 30,000 plus population. And then we actually, have a look at that population, but we balance out like if the demographic profile, socioeconomic rating slightly lower, will drive the population higher. So mm. we, we, we use it. It is science. We use a mixture of, and we do all the territory planning of geographics, um, demographics, um, profiles, um, and obviously the population. So we then bring the territories. Then we consider other things such as, um, like, all right, there's a new estate coming in this area, so let's just wrap that into the territory, even though it's at, because we can see 10-year forecast of what the population's going to be. And if it's like, all right, um, uh, Pimpama on the Gold Coast, for example, that's a hot territory at the moment um, for us all around that area, Northern Gold Coast. So Pimpama's got X amount of people, but in 10 years, it's going to actually go up by, you know, 70%. So then we'll wrap in where all those developments are going for that franchisee. Um, mm -hmm. knowing that that's going to be protected for them on year seven of their franchise agreement instead of at the start because you always want that long range. Yeah. It's not as easy as just buying a kettlebell and opening the shed, is it? <laughs> There's a lot that goes into it, yeah, yeah. So, like, I guess, how did you learn that? Like, obviously, you started 2001, 2008, your second location. Is there a franchising mentor that you work with saying, hey, these are the five things? Like, that 44 step checklist how did you come up with that uh, experience on that one through 500 plus inspections we've landed 20 properties over time but i've used multiple mentors over the years i had a um i had a we had an advisory board for four and a half years which was great quarterly meetings um lot, the good thing about the franchise sector is that everyone even fitness industry franchises like it's not like there's like um to my knowledge anyway um not like a lot of like in competition within the franchise sector where it's like, we're not sharing. Like I've speak to people from other brands and everyone's quite sharing of information because we know we've all got a pretty tough job as a franchise. Also people know what we're going through. So a, a lot of people in franchising are extremely sharing. So I, I've definitely used a lot of mentors, uh, lots of experience. And now I'm coming up. Well, yeah, I've just passed it. I've actually passed 10 years of franchisor as well as my main job. So it's 10 years experience. Yeah. You learn so much as a franchisor. So I went from a PT to a studio manager, um, single unit to a franchisor. And the franchisor has been my um, get out of bed motivation for 10 years, um, which which I'm trying to be obviously be the best I can at. Yeah. In your opinion, what is the biggest mistake that franchisors make in the early days? 
trying to grow too fast is um, probably one. Trying to grow too fast, but also probably not having um, franchisors what they can make is um, n- not having a deep enough, strong enough systems and processes that they can implement for the guys to give them the best chance of being successful. So I'd say they're the two main things. But one would be probably like, because when, when you're a franchisor, like you think about it and think, oh, yeah, I can sell a franchise for 30 grand. I've got 30 grand in the bank, whatever the money is. But I'll, I'll tell you hand on heart, you never make money out of that $30,000. You lose money out of the $30,000. Where fran- so tell, so tell, me, tell me about that, right? So you sell a territory for 30000 mm. and that secures the rights for a listen to your body in the area. It comes with mm. your systems, your advice, the 44-point mm. checklist. Mm. What do you mean by you lose money off that? Yeah, so because we're so hands on with the site selection as well. So I'll give you an example of a recent, uh, well, I'll give you, actually, no, I won't give you an example of a recent open, but I'll give you one just in general. Like you, you find a site and say time is money, of course, we know that. You might put in between two to 300 hours of executive time by your mm. hourly rate alone. That's just a loan. So if your hourly, you know, let's just say the average executive, 100, 150 bucks an hour multiply, you know, there's your 30 grand already just in time. That's let alone saying, hey, you can have um, systems and processes and assets, marketing, lead generation campaign that's cost us um, 20 years of trading to get to this level. So the expense to run that, you'd argue, is an extra 10 million bucks, right? But you can have it for nothing, yeah. right? <laughs> and yeah. then... Then you go, oh, yeah, it's in Sydney. I've made three trips up already to the Sydney place before it's even open. There's flights, accommodation. Yeah. So, Ben, is it fair to say that some franchisors aren't as diligent with you in the openings and they do make money? It's like, I guess what I'm saying is, like, are there franchisors out there that you know of that you've heard of in the past that just, like, they make money on that fee and just, like, open up 10 more and bounce? Look, I, I can't speak for specific brands, but if of I do, I, I am aware of that people, if you buy a franchise, for example, and I know of a franchise, so there is franchise systems that may say, hey, mate, congratulations, you've got a franchise that everything you need is on the portal. Good luck with site selection. Good luck with this. Good luck with this. But if you want to, if you want to bounce any ideas off us, um, feel free. I guess yeah, send me an email. Little, yeah, and I think it's more the ones that, you know, 50, 60, thousand dollars we're sort of a bit more um lower cost of entry our sort of theory is is that we we make it a little bit lower and probably over service and sort of don't have the expectation to make money off the franchise um fee there it's just more to cover some cost um for a bit of time so like even even say you know one of 22 is we've probably put in nine hours this week of time to our studio we opened last last saturday and clearly Mm. everyone's on payroll that's not for free and um yeah of course yeah so um i dare say there is maybe some that do that and and what happens is that they can then um taking it back a step with us one benefit we've got it creates a better relationship that we've got we've got a great relationship with our franchisees like I, i cannot remember touch touch wood and hope it doesn't happen I reckon it's been five years since where well, maybe one or two we've had where, where we've had some like a complaint to us. We we very rarely get anyone say, hey, I'm not happy with this from the franchise or I'm not happy with this. So I feel that our franchise network's got an amazing culture. But I think what builds that is our high touch point with our guys and know I'm inside out with all their metrics. We really help them get started like um, yeah, on site for training. We help it. We even sit in on, on the job interviews for their personal trainers. Really so, far out. Yeah. yeah, so we're very high touch point as a franchise. And from our people say, well, how do you actually make money? But to be honest, a, fr- a franchise model in a can be make money is it's not it's not on the thirty thousand. It's 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 not on the first three to four months of them operating. It's when they're operating, and even though we're still here and we have two to three touch points a week, um, I spoke to our multi site owner only about half hour before this, and I'll speak to him um, about two matters. So we're very high touch point, but they don't need you as much when they're really competent. But then yeah, that's where we can survive and go okay with uh, royalties, even though what we do yeah. when they when they really perform, we cap their royalties as well. It's almost like a gym membership. Like you get to onboard someone, put more time in at the start, and they, mm. they're a member for 10 years, and yeah. you're still getting, getting dues in 10 years' time without having to have 100 touch points. It might be yeah, three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's actually like a good thing because that like they'll like um, – they actually don't 
need to waste their time. I, I don't need to ask Talia this because I know this now so well. I know what to do in this situation, but they've still got us and they'll still get value in other ways. Like, you know, they'll still get value with our site visit and go, oh, I reckon we can update this with this marketing, change the words on this or jump onto this campaign or whatever it is. So they've still got value, but just early days is so much like touch points to get them on brand. So yeah, yeah that's how it cool. works. Mm. Yeah. And I guess like when you're on a pre-sale, mate, what is that process like? So they've done the, they've gone through five steps. They got the territory. You found the site. They negotiate. How far out do you announce, hey, listen to your body is coming to X area. And what is that process like from the announcement to, to day one? So eight weeks out, we usually do like a soft launch, more of an awareness campaign for the first two weeks. Then it ramps up the next two weeks on a foundation membership. Um, there's other things that, depending on the studio, but the other things we do in the area, such as, you know, get around to local businesses, alignments, um, some hard copy, um, local marketing. And then as a four weeks um, to go, it ramps up again. Each, each block of two weeks, the ad spend goes up. It's mainly social media, which gets 95%. Then what we usually do, depending on how the foundation memberships are going on one offer, we put a second offer into the market, which is our six-week kickstart. So people sometimes prefer that rather than the foundation month to month. And then the last two weeks, we really ramp it up and split test what ones, which strategy is, is dominating. And we put more funds into that. Um, and then the week before we open, we, we organize tours. We do trial sessions because the joint's ready. Um, and then we launch. And recently, have you found doing a pre-sale, it's easier to go straight to foundation membership or have you found the six-week kickstart to be more effective? Good question. It's a really good question. It just feels like it's um, – I can't answer directly on what's better over the pattern of the last five because, like, there's no doubts about it. Like, the foundations, um, the foundations are, are strong – but then when you chuck a six-week kickstart in, there's something about a six-week, about a time frame that appeals mm. to people and go, yeah, I can do six weeks rather than unending. And even – so we don't have contracts that listen to your body. So no one's locked into anything. They can stop at any time. So basically that's okay. But still on the surface when they see membership, they worry about being locked in. Um, mm. So – the six weeks, I think they're both as good as each other. It just depends on the area. Like one of them, one of the studios, I should know exactly. I think it was a Mart. I think it was a Martin one. No, they were foundations. So it was another one I was thinking of. Um, the South Australian one, they just went foundations and went bananas and they just smashed it. They got their target um, two days prior, I believe it was. So, um, yeah, and awesome. then the six weeks. Yeah. So they're both good, I reckon. You've got to do both to yeah. see what the market's wanting. Mm. So something I found, mate, we've got two gyms in Newcastle, one at Adams yeah. Town, one at Cardiff, and they're like seven kilometers away. And they may as well be on different planets. Yeah, right? it's just yeah. every single location is different. It is. Cult cultural yeah. diversity is a huge thing. Like it just, every, yeah. and that's where like I love your franchise being so flexible. Hey, let's test these two things and yeah. work out what works better. Not this is the only way because it is yeah. it is preposterous to think that one strategy works in Dubbo and then yeah. works in Port Melbourne. Yeah, it's so true. And preaching the converted here, there's other ways to monitor that, like you know how many leads we're getting, what our what our um, ad spend is, what the common objections are. So you just got to um, monitor it really closely and see what's working. And if it's not working, there's and I'd probably say this to anyone in a pre-launch or even existing, I don't think there's need for panic stations. Just accept that. I always work on a three-week theory. If something's even with our KPIs, I work on a three-week theory. So three weeks to me is a pattern. It's like oh, this week's you know leads were down or sales were down or attendance were down. Oh well, whatever. Week two. Oh, they're down a little bit. Hmm, must watch this space. Week three. Oh, we've got a slight problem. What do we got to do? And if it's attendance on a KPI, well, we've got to put, we've got to find out whether we've got the right PT team, which hopefully, you know, you've already got. But mm. yeah, so anyway. Yeah, just, cool. yeah. Mm. And, and I guess like with a pre sale, so just from my experience, when we opened our gyms, we opened yeah. seven, we used to launch with about 10, or oh, probably, probably 5,000 ad spend in 2015 and got closer to 10 for our last gym. Like, what type of, marketing budget are you are you opening with like do you have like a do you have like a like just i am just learning so much from this call by the way thank you so much like <laughs> if, you right. open, if you open up a franchise like do you say hey like you should absolutely spend x amount or is it bait 
Like, or do they spend more? Like, what is your experience there? Yeah, I reckon it goes close to 5000 all up on the ad spend. We don't go too hard too early. It's more just awareness. Um, mm. But the last couple of weeks, it really dials up. Like, um, Bell Gala last week, yeah, last four weeks, they've spent 3000 So, yeah, 3000 last four weeks. So I'd say five would be about the sweet spot. I mean... As you know yourself, like we'd love to, we'd love to say to guys spend ten thousand bucks and they'll get the leads. And if they're getting them, yeah, they might. Martin were, were quite aggressive in South Australia. They were they were quite aggressive even even after open and it worked. So and it's a great place to run ads, mate. It's a great place to run ads, Adelaide. Oh, yeah, Adelaide's Adelaide's unbelievable. Adelaide's what what that studio yeah. is doing in Adelaide we've never seen before. Well, then um, yeah, yeah. I yeah. Think from my experience running our gyms, like the further you are away from the city central, like ads are higher performing. Yeah. Because people don't know this, Ben, but if you're running ads in Bondi Junction, yeah. you're competing with Louis Vuitton and Chanel. And wow. And in, in Dubbo, you're competing with the Western Plain Zoo, right? So if wow. there's more ads spent in a location, you're not competing yeah. against gyms. You're competing against ad spend in that yeah. location. Yeah. Right? Oh, okay. Yeah. And that's why that's why gyms results are typically affected around yeah. the World Cup because yeah. Nike is pumping money into women's soccer. Yeah. They'll be they'll be affected Black Friday because every yeah. man and their dog's advertising. So I guess like lo- the, the location good. is so important, mate. Like we, we work with gyms all over Australia and it is it is apples and oranges. It it, it, it's, it still blows yeah. my, blows me away. Yeah, I agree. I couldn't agree. That's actually, you know, whether you've just taught me something there, James. I didn't realize that Louis Vuitton would uh, steal our um, steal our yeah. attention. So yeah, take t- attention away from us. But yeah, that's yeah. Good. So, so, so it's not so. There's there's like, we work with gyms in Rose Bay, and they pay about a hundred bucks a lead, and they're happy, which would oh, be wow. crazy for a listen to your body when we're getting leads for five bucks. Yeah. Right? Wow. But then the Ro- but then the Rose Bay clients doing four PT sessions a week for ten grand LTV, right? So. But Rose Bay, it's not because there's more gyms there. It's because they're literally competing with like, hey, there's a Roosters game on this weekend. And yeah. the Roosters, like, do you know what I mean? That's crazy. Crazy. Yeah. That's nuts. Mm. Yeah. So, mate, I guess like when you open up a franchise, like is there a, is it a, is there a member target? Is there a profit target? Or is it based on like, hey, with this rent, these are expenses. We expect you to be here. Yeah, good question. There's always a member target by a deadline that we want signed up. We've got standard benchmarks, what we have for our uh, for all of our KPIs with our monthly signups, with our um, with our uh, direct debit run, our sales. And how we do it is we've got a pretty cool corporate dashboard where we drag all the data across all the studios. So we're able to work out what our network average is. And depending on what stage of growth that studio is at, um, we, we we aim to um we obviously aim to we give the feedback based on that but in regards to the target on the studio based on the rent we wouldn't make assumptions if one place is 70 or if one place is 90 it's more we just feel that it's just like all right this place has got thirty thousand people in it we just want 200 of those thirty thousand people yeah of course. training yeah. with us um and then we can see what our what our benchmark targets is and we communicate that actually weekly on our um, corporate leaderboard so and then we do a um yeah we do a data dump monthly and then quarterly and have a records for every kpi for our studios on monthly quarterly yeah. uh, do you annually. find that your your lower performers are reaching out to your high performers and the high performers are happy to help and share their secrets and share their wins there's no doubts about it they're so happy to share our network like our network is really really supportive of each other it's so tight the the electricity of our last few con- conferences we've had nine now whatever it is but um is always amazing the last couple ways we've grown they're, they're just so helpful it's not uncommon like four of them just jump on a zoom once a month and talk about business and yeah, others so cool. others contact that yeah so um low performance they reach out look i think um I think there could be probably more of it um, for different ones. I mean, if I was to buy a franchise in, let's just say, uh, Coffee Club comes to mind for some reason. I don't know why, but uh, let's say Coffee Club, I'd be trying to locate, all right, who are the best franchise um, franchisees and what are they doing? And I'll be trying to just – I'd fly into state to see them and just sit there for two days and watch how they operate. Um, and I reckon if a studio was a low performer, invested $500 to – travel to say South Australia and just sat there for two days, they'll probably increase their sales by 20%. And that $500 will turn into 50 quick, 50,000. Mm. Mate, what is 
your opinion, your experience, what you've seen, what do your high performers have in common? What what are their traits? It's it's four things. It's always well, firstly they've got ridiculous hustle around everything. Like they're just they're so driven and they've got the hustle. So there's four things that make a listen to your body really, really successful or or not so successful, but most of them are successful, thankfully. But it's always sales culture, like having that sales hustle, um, having great service, PT service, great people management, and great business management. So what I mean by that is being able to manage staff, recruit staff, inspire staff, uh, good relationship with members, suppliers, head office, so good people's first people, um, great service. Like members, like even though we've got systemized technology with programming, you still need a good service, um, vibrant, upbeat, quality PTs, yeah. engaging, as we know. Like yeah, it's, mate, some, someone's going to be giving those high fives. You've got to be. You've got to, you've got to have a good PT team. You always ask yourself the question, would I pay for If I'm an owner, I'm thinking, would I pay for them to train me? If the answer is no, you've got to move them on or upskill them. Um, mm-hmm. So, And then great business management. What, what that comes down to is the, you know, like overseeing everything, the marketing, the compliance, the strategy, the budgets, and managing the business well. There's some really good business people within our system. And funny enough, in our system, the ones that are the highest performers are stronger at business and some of them aren't even personal trainers. They just love fitness and business and they make the best, mm. the best franchisees. So you mentioned sales culture, mate. My favorite thing. Let's talk about that. How do you cultivate sales culture and how do you take someone who isn't a natural salesperson or enjoy that process and help them understand like, Hey, like you love fitness. You want to help people, but you need to do the first thing and get them through the front door. So, um, mate, I've got an easy answer for that. We just say, be good at sales, and they are. <laughs> That's incorrect. So, <laughs> with sales, firstly, sales culture, it's in a lot in the training, in the franchisee induction, even the franchise application. It's like, hey, you've got to be able to love selling, or you've got to sell. If you don't sell, um, and you're you're not just selling memberships, you're selling a vision to your staff, you're selling re, you know results, you're selling everything, you're selling yourself when you speak to the per, the barista of how you say, "Can I have a coffee, please?" You're selling, you're always selling. So you need to be you need sales. To- is sales is simply persuasion? Like, yeah. And I, if I want to persuade my girl to girlfriend to have Thai over Indian, yeah. I am going through a sales process. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I do the same thing with my wife. When I wanted to play cricket for an extra year, what I'd always do, I'd wait till she finished her run, wait till she's in a great mood, and then she endorphins are going nuts. I go, you know what? I feel like going another year. She's great idea, Ben. I'd never say it at yeah. the end of the day when she's tired. So you guys, <laughs> that's not the best example, but. So back yeah. to it with sales, it's, it's a lot. A lot of it's in the training with the culture, and then if people aren't naturally strong at it, all, all we try and really work hard on is stick to our processes for sales. So we've got obviously different checkpoints we've got to get through from inquiry to first session, which is eleven. But anyway, once we get through those um, processes, that's all we can do. And then to be honest, some people will. Um, I guess nod and go, yeah, yeah, I know I need to, I know I need to. And and to be honest, just not do it and it'll hurt them. They'll be a middle performer. It's just about yeah. how much they find it within themselves to take the content information. You can't force someone to it. But to my earlier sarcastic comment, I wish I could say, oh, Jamie, if you want to be a successful listen to your body franchise owner, you need to be amazing in sales. And Jamie says, look, I hate sales, but I do it. Oh, so all that. It won't. Yeah. It doesn't. Yeah. So that's so really interesting, mate, because I've coached a lot of gym owners with sales. And don't get me wrong, you can be technically good at sales. You can understand yeah. the alternate clothes and all that type of yeah. stuff. But it is naturally the, your belief around sales. Yeah. What is sales? Like, we are not selling used cars. Yeah. Like, yeah. We're not, we're not twisting someone's arm and annoying yeah. them and like pestering them. Like, yeah. listen to your body has an amazing service. Sally, yeah. 50 kilos overweight, we can yeah. help her. Yeah. Like, if you didn't have to convince her, you wouldn't be yeah. required. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and I actually think with selling, like, we use a lot of the term- terminology around problem solving. Um, and I oh, genuine fear. Like, when I was selling memberships, I actually felt I wasn't selling to – I mean, I was, but I wasn't selling to fill up our pockets to get a sale – I would actually be letting them down if I didn't get them started. So I actually felt, no, 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 it's not about me trying to sell to get a sale, even though we know, you know, we all do. 
But it's like, yeah. well, I can't let you walk out the door without committing because I'm letting you down. So yeah. and Mate, that's I've, lo- I've lost I've lost sleep over people I haven't been able to help. Yeah, like, yeah. Because yeah. you understand like, hey, like I can help you lose this weight. I can help fix your knee injury. I can help yeah. give you more energy yeah. to be the parent that your kids deserve. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. selling is helping them understand like, hey, like I have this problem yeah. and we have a solution. We're not tricking yeah. people. We're not yeah. pulling one over on someone. It's just like yeah. Wolf of Wall Street, favorite movie of all time, but geez, yeah. it's given salespeople a bad name. Yeah, I know, I know, because it was all. Yeah, it is a great. It was one of. It's actually one of my favorites as well. Actually, probably my favorite, which is crazy. But yeah, it it it, it, it certainly is. But um, yeah, I agree with you. Mm. Yeah. So, mate, like, let's talk about listening to your body, the brand itself. So, I'm working with two of your franchisees, and why I love working with you guys is that you really have a focus on beginners. You have a focus on a little bit more of an older population yeah. and a focus on people that typically wouldn't walk into a 24 seven gym with bodybuilders. Yeah. How did you, how did you visualize that brand and how have you, how have you rolled out your vision to other franchisees? So when we're at Asco Vale uh, for that eight years, we basically learned what all of the things that, um, and by saying this, this is no disrespect in any way to um, to gyms across the world uh, for me saying this, but for, for my belief pattern, I was trying to work out, go, what, what do people don't like about big gyms that are timid? And then I sort of worked out. I go, oh, I don't reckon they like mirrors. <laughs> and I was like, they don't like they don't like contracts. They don't like intimidation. They don't like being yelled at. All these sort of things that so we learnt over an eight year period. So when we created the first um, shooter, go, ah, oh, no mirrors, no contracts, no joining fees, no exit fees. We took out all those things in the industry that people um, didn't really like, and also uh, a sector didn't like. Should I say for you and me, we're probably no problems because we're we're in we're in for fitness for life. So you and me can join any place yeah. and we're fine. So and I'll, people, I'll join. people 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 forget that. They actually forget it. Like they forget that I am confident in a dumbbell yeah. section when there's a guy yeah. benching 40 kilos next to me. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. No issues at all. We can coexist anywhere. So but then we're a minority, right? Um in Australia anyway, that that are self, you know, that's what we do with the industry. But um so then I sort of thought what else don't they like? And go, oh, just the intimidation of keeping up with others. Can and then with my, I guess, back in the day, with my brain when it comes to beliefs on training, it's like, well, if I've been training six times a week for fifteen years, there's no way I should be doing the same as a sixty-year-old that's thirty kilo overweight, bad knees and hips. So how do we personalize it? And that's where we sort of cut up the model and put these zones in place where we've got advanced movements and regressed, and then we individualize based on that person. So when when it comes to the rollouts, all of our studios are non, I guess, physical, um, you know, the physical side of the industry of, you know, before and after photos and um, that side, more about the well-being piece and then the non-intimidation um, sort of that is really tailored for that timid person because we want to try and remove the fear of joining. So we've just, I guess, cut up lots of different things to target to that market. Then we communicate them um, through our through our marketing, through our socials, through our studios, through our newsletters, through our content, through our conversations. Here's the crazy thing, Ben. Here's the secret. Your market is bigger than the market that most gyms are going after. Like We're going after 80... the 80%. <laughs> yeah, you're going after people that are on the couch. Yeah, that's and who we I want. And to the gym owners I work with, like you're not trying to get someone from BFT into an F45 yeah. into a fit stop. Yeah. Like you are going for that person that, that doesn't feel comfortable. You're going for that person off the couch because if you give them a good experience and you transform their lives, that's when they stay for 10 years and they literally become your biggest fan. Yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. That's why people sometimes say when people go for franchise, oh, but BFT are in the street, um, fit style. I said, we, we can coexist with them. We, we won't we won't take their clients and they won't take ours. And as a matter of fact, no. it's advantageous to have, have others in there because it's more marketing messages are getting pumped into the community to raise awareness with fitness. So we deliberately have opened up right next to gyms because we always get the bottom 20% that are not um, that are not active. So there's no problems there because we're going after a totally different market. We want the, we want the 50 year old that hasn't been in for 20 years. Yeah. And it's really interesting. Mate. I've done thousands of sales calls 
And one of the questions is, what have you tried previously? And, oh, like, yeah, I was at a gym in 2004. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Like, so then, like, if you listen to your body is marketing to beginners and a little bit older people, then, like, oh, man, I, I just love your brand. I love what it stands for. And it reminds me of our two gyms and who we've gone after. Yeah, there's some synergies, isn't there? Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, 100%. Well, mate, what is what is the future of listening to your body? So you started in 2001. You now, is it 14 or more locations? Now? Uh, 16, 16, Six, I think. Yeah. 16 locations. Yeah. What does the next five years look like for listening to your body? Well, we've got a few in the pipeline as well, a few territories sold. So all going well. We start those projects early next year. Um, for us, like we're focused on, like we'd love to open up five a year. So for the next five years, we'd love to open up on average five a year. For us, it's really interesting. Uh, everyone asks me this question all the time and in multiple podcasts, like, how many do you want by when? It's like, oh, it's not really about having 50 exactly by 2026. It's not about having 100 by 2029. For us, um, we would like to onboard five year and retain what we've got. But our biggest focus is the franchisee profitability. So we're happy to grow to 200 if, if the franchisee profitability numbers are there and we've got the operational team to manage that growth. So um, for us, it's just a focus of yet we'd love to open five a year and take it one year at a time, but carefully um, manage the culture, carefully manage the performance, carefully manage um, the, the growth of the business. Because I've seen many businesses go from 20 to 50 fast but then they might drop five to seven in a hurry because the the bums fallen out of it because they haven't had the operational support because the focus has been on the on the growth. So for us, we mm. we we work more from the inside out rather than the outside in. Yeah. So as long as franchise profitability is there, it's mm. open them, and then if that yeah. drops below your number, okay. Well, yeah. let, let's fix your operations. Let's yeah. fix these. Yeah. And then let's grow again. And the dangerous thing is when you say I want 50 by then, I've seen brands do this and clearly not going to name, but I've seen brands do it and I go, oh, I don't know why they keep rolling out for because I'm seeing, because I'm on real estate.com, real commercial every day. I'm seeing so many like, you know, these studios on the market. I was oh, like, yeah. how can they be still selling? Like we've had two, we've had two phases in our time where I haven't been happy with average profit. I said, I think the guys got to perform better. Like few of them are smashing it, but not enough. So we've paused all um, advertising and even gone back to the, pull the engine apart for six months and then go again once we've fixed it. So, and, and, and if you, if you fixated on a, you know, 50 by 2026 20, FY 26, then all of a sudden you go, Oh no, I can't stop growing. So I've got to get to 50 because that was the target. That's what we get out of bed. Yeah. We go, well, hang and on a minute. Then, and then you, and then you sell fire to the overweight smoker. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. Cause you get fixated on numbers. And that's why we've been, hesitant to get external recruiters in. We've never done it. We've always done internal and the process is quite thorough to own and listen to your body. I'm pretty sure that would be, you know, probably probably too thorough to be honest, but we'd never give someone the keys to the car unless we thought that could be profitable. Yeah, man. I, I just like, I just, I have so much respect for the way you've run your franchise. Cause like I'm in a lot of gyms, like over a hundred at the moment. And I yeah. just, it's horror story after horror story after horror story. And it is not one particular franchise. It is a lot of them. Mm. And I had the same feelings. Like, how can you have your, how can you have half your network dying mm. and then celebrate an opening? Like, it just, it, it, it makes me mad. <laughs> Like, it, yeah, I agree. And there's so much stuff on socials about, oh, we've opened with 150 members. That's great. We don't want to actually open with 150 first day because I guarantee because of the personalization, like we want 100 by day 21, but on the first week, we want more like 60 so we can manage them and spread them out over the week to retain them. So it's good seeing on the surface the numbers. And then we'd rather build our businesses this way, like our franchise for more sustainable growth rather than go like this and do a cheap membership to potentially level out depending on the on the business model but i agree totally i think that it's got to be number one always has to be franchisee probably because at the end of the day if you get it wrong in a business as you and i both know as business owners you could lose your house your well-being your marriage your your kids whatever your goals are and it's what for you know so you've got to mm. be you've got to go with eyes wide open be careful on your strategy ben i finish this podcast with the exact same question what's one question i should have asked you that I didn't ask you. <laughs> what football team do I beg for? <laughs> it's Carlton. Um, yeah. Mate, I think you've covered it, honestly. I don't feel that anything comes to mind. Um, 
No, I, I honestly nothing comes to mind, so I'm not going. I'm, I'm not going to make it up. I think you're a brilliant host, and you asked all the questions, and you you went right through the journey. So, um, thanks, mate. I appreciate perfect. it. Well, mate, thanks for coming on. I really, really appreciate it. I uh, I'm humbled and honoured that a franchise would come on the podcast and share their journey. So, thank you so much, guys. If you want to connect with Ben, there'll be show notes. There'll be links in the comments. But like. I'm pretty honest. I'm pretty direct. I'm pretty confrontational <laughs> to a point. And I just absolutely admire everything you've done, mate. And I think you're doing it the right way. Oh, thanks so much, mate. Really appreciate it. Thanks, thanks for having me on. Really appreciate right. it. Thanks. Bye guys.